Okay, with me right now is Gerardo Parada. Um, Mr. Parada um, has written articles for uh, Primo Magazine in the past. Uh, he's a historian in Cincinnati, Ohio. He comes with a science background. And this is always good because uh, people with um, backgrounds in science uh, tend to really delve into things and investigate things uh, thoroughly. And so uh, this is what you get when uh, Mr. Parada ever writes an article for you or does anything of that effect. He's, um, he's written for us about stamps and stamp collecting and uh, Italian American themes related to that. And that's always uh, interesting. But uh, he comes to us today with a distressing situation um, in Cincinnati. Uh, the uh, Lupa statue that's been there since 1931 in Eden Park. It was a gift uh, to Cincinnati from the Italian American community there uh, was stolen back in June. And um, Gerardo is here to talk to us about that and to see what the latest is. What is the latest, by the way, Gerardo? Um, have the police uh, made any announcements at all regarding the, to any suspects or anything of that effect? None that I'm aware of. And in fact, uh, last night uh, I was checking with the president of the United Italian Society of Cincinnati, and he, he confirmed for me that there's still no leads whatsoever, no reports from the uh, investigation, uh, none from the police department, uh, which is sad to say, I'm sure they have other priorities in the uh, grand scheme of things, but uh, it's, um, it, it's a sad state of affairs when uh, something that precious disappears overnight and nobody sees or hears anything. It had to be more than one person to chop off the legs of a bronze statue and lift up a 500 pound uh, statue that was made in Italy. So uh, someone must have seen something or somebody must have covered for somebody uh, so uh, I'm sure the, the investigators have their hands full on the nature of the theft. When in June was it stolen? What, what uh, was it beginning of June? or The 17th, the middle, the middle of June. And there was the somebody was walking. Early, okay. early 18, somebody was jogging in the morning and they oh, noticed that it was gone. Oh, my goodness. It's a nice area of, uh, of Cincinnati. Yeah. Beautiful, bucolic area. Um it's close to Chrome Conservatory, one of the finest uh, botanical gardens in the country, in my view. And um, it's a beautiful scenic park. And we always enjoyed uh, going to that park, seeing the various things. There's Japanese garden, there's uh, Twin Lakes. It overlooks the Ohio River, which I dubbed the Tiber. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasant area uh, to be in. And yet this, this unfortunate incident, uh, you know, uh, happened. Yeah. But it's been happening so many places, you know, but it's been pretty much Columbus has been the, uh, the target, uh, either, okay. uh, either this, uh, a city, um, the mayor or the city council will rule to tear down a statue or vandals may do it as well. But in this case, this is not a Columbus depiction. This is the depiction of the um, Capitoline wolf, the she-wolf right. legend that gave uh, refuge and nourishment to Romulus and Remus, uh, the founders of Rome. Right. And um, as you stated, this was a replica. And so maybe I can post a photograph of it, but it's just, you, all you see now is you have the, the granite base, I guess, and the two children and right. then I guess the paws are <laughs> the uh, and the paws, right? The the, remnant, the bottom of the the paws. That's all it's left. They chuck, they cut it right there. Nice job, a clean cut, all four legs, and um, uh, the the children look the uh, Romulus and Remus are orphaned. Yes. By the they're orphaned now too. They're orphaned and they're exactly. orphaned again. Aren't they? And I'm not, so, you know, I'm surprised they didn't take those two guys too. But yeah, uh, right, right, right. They, well, how they cut? Just out of curiosity, how could they cut something like that? I guess they could get a uh, some sort of saw or something. Saw. It had to be yeah. sawed because it it looks pretty smooth, uh, even cut. Yeah, right. And it had to be rapid. So. And it's uh, 500 pounds, so they must have. Uh, no one man could do it. It must have been. 
right. two people or they must have had some sort of contraption. I would think that... They lift it up and yeah, move it sure. right away. Uh, yeah, and even if they did it in the dead of night, somebody must have seen something. I mean, it's not every day you see a brown's wolf going down the street or, or going exactly. through a park or something like that. Right. Yeah, so, it's not you know. like you could throw it over the wall there in right, the right. river and let it float or sink. But right, right. No. Well, in the article, you wrote an article about this for us, uh, and it's on our website at uh, www um online primo.com and you indicated that um there could be two motivations one of course is just the the greed and the avarice of of, of criminality right. but the other uh motivation which i'm inclined to think is the actual motivation would be a political one and you can give us details about that why it might be a, a political motivation to yeah uh, in the in the past uh, uh, one of the uh, con local councilmen has made some remarks that that statue does not belong, a gift from Mussolini does not belong in the, in the city parks. And immediately he got a lot of blowback from the, not only the Italian American community, but from several other areas, uh, including the classics department of Cincinnati. Oh, okay. And on that note, uh, he withdrew his, his comments and said that he, uh, Given the feedback that he had received, uh, he would think further about uh, the nature of his statements that for now uh, the issue is was dead. He was about to present a motion to city council to have this, this statue removed and so on. I think anybody listening with a criminal intent just with that says, ah, I'm going to do this councilman a favor. I'm just going to take the statue away. And nobody's going to be worried about it because they don't like it in there anyway. Right. That aspect is, a, you know, I, I admit it's a far-fetched argument, but I can see some ill-intentioned individual using that as a motivation to do a criminal act. Well, I see that also. But, you know, it, even if the councilman withdrew the statement or whatever, right. I mean, it's, uh, you can maybe uh, enlighten us about this. I mean, the, the local media, did they report about it being a Mussolini gift, per se, and not necessarily right. the ex exact uh, accuracy? The local media, I, I believe, did a, a, a decent coverage, and, but they always have to inject in there the connection to the Mussolini statement. And that's what motivated me to write the article, to say that, Okay, it happened during the time of Mussolini. It happened to coincide with the 10th year of his anniversary, even though the request preceded the 10th year anniversary of the power. It, 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 it happened to coincide with the request going to Rome because apparently the, the leaders, the Italian American leaders of the time knew that they were, uh, Mussolini was giving away uh, the Lupa, Capitolina Lupa, uh, as gifts. But he did not generate, Mussolini did not generate the gift. The Italians generated the thought of getting the gift and they requested it. So they, they got it made and it was sent here. Interestingly enough, the other cities that have received, I believe the one in uh, Rome, Georgia, and others, they received not only the statue, but also the fascist. Um, emblems accompanying it, but in Cincinnati, no. They only had the uh, governatore di Roma, the, the governor of Rome, to the people of Cincinnati. So this goes to, uh, well with the thought that the Italian Americans who were celebrating their um, OS, OSI at that time, they were having a, a biennial convention in Cincinnati, the, an opportune time to thank the city for their uh, good accoglienza, the welcoming to the Italian American community, the the progress the Italians had made, and so on, and give them a genuine gift that that tied in with the name of Cincinnati, Cincinnati. Right. You know, if Mussolini had paid any attention to the gift that he was giving to which city, he probably would have acted like Cincinnati, <laughs> fulfill his. <laughs> His obligation and go back to uh, to farming, plowing so, the fields, right? <laughs> exactly. But and, and that's also a lesson that I like to put out that Cincinnati, in this particular guard, in uh, regard, the Lupa can focus attention. Why we have it here? Why is Cincinnati named Cincinnati? Uh, out of the Cincinnati Society, which was formed by a revolutionary 
war veteran, uh, Arthur St. Clair. So all of these elements have an, Ita an, an important Italian connection to the yeah. city of Cincinnati that one looking at the lupa can immediately make a, a, a sound connection. And also the message to the politicians, act like Cincinnati, Cincinnati's. You know, do your job and then go back to your uh, previous employment. That's a good idea. I don't know if they'll take our advice about it, because some of them have been here for 50 or 60 years. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, but Cincinnatus was the hero of Rome, just so everybody understands. And this was back during the time, I guess, of Julius Caesar, right around that period, maybe before. Prior, probably. Yeah. And yeah. he was a uh, war hero. And because of his heroic status, they wanted him to, um, you know, ascend in the Senate and the political atmosphere. But he said, no, uh, I, you know, I fought for Rome's survival and I'm going to go back to my farm and plow the fields and be the, uh, the, the genuine farmer that I always was. This is, of course, an act of nobility and humility in his part. And it's always something that uh, uh, people would want to emulate. And that's the how the, the war, society and, uh, originated in, in the United States, Henry Knox who was a colleague of George Washington, and George Washington applied that principle. Once he served his time as president, he says, now I'm going back to my farm. He was the original American Cincinnatus, if you will. Yeah, well, they have the, uh, the society headquarters is located here in Washington, D.C., on Massachusetts Avenue, just before you get down to DuPont Circle, right where Massachusetts Avenue interconnects with um, Connecticut Avenue. And it's a beautiful neoclassic building and they have a museum there. They'll have uh, certain exhibits and that sort of thing. But yeah. there's a statue, I, I'm not sure, I think there's a, it's either it's a statue of, uh, I think it's a statue of Washington. Uh -huh. And uh, now there you have the, the fascist symbol, but that right. doesn't, but that was, it was way before Mussolini had Roman, shown up. Yeah, it goes back yeah. to the Roman times. Exactly, exactly, right. exactly, exactly. So that's what that's all about. So let me ask you, so let me uh, clarify one thing also. So the people in Cincinnati back, I guess it was 1929 or whatever, right. the Italian American community, they wanted to give a gift to Cincinnati, right. uh, a statue to, for Cincinnati and gratitude for the city and for the country. So after that, did they, did Mussolini reach out to them or did they reach out to Mussolini? How did that turn out? How did that go about? You know, that I'm not clear. Okay. They the the chorus i'm trying to trace to see if i can get a hold of the original correspondence that may have taken place and so far I'm, i've come up short but my understanding is from what i read into in uh, sister blandina's magazine uh, veritas from the santa maria institute because that has an original italian article they said that the principles at that time it went, the request went from the council, the council representative of Cincinnati, Mr. Ginocchio, to the consular agent in Cleveland. From Cleveland, they went to, uh, uh, to Washington and from Washington to Rome through the Italian chain of uh, uh, representatives that they had in this country. So I'm not sure if the original uh, um, Cincinnati request reached the eyes of M Mussolini or Ludovisi, who was the governor of Rome at that time. And, and Mussolini just said, oh, yeah, good, just send it, or something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. But that he, that he had any uh, direct link or understanding of what was happening in Cincinnati, I sincerely doubt it. I, I did too, yeah, I did too. I mean, what, what connection did he have with Cincinnati? I mean, just doesn't seem None crazy. that I can think of. Yeah. So it went through the process through the consular agent, as far as I can tell, from uh, Mr. Ginocchio, Ferraresi. These were uh, the high standing public figures of Italian Americans at the time. Uh, Dr. Valerio uh, and a few others. And they went through the channels to make the request known to the Italian government at that time. So they didn't have to pay for the statue. The stat they could get the statue for free, I guess, or. That's another element to see that I cannot find I see, yeah. if they have any uh, records of having had to pay for it. Uh, the, the latest that I know in terms of replacing it is that uh, through the efforts of the current uh, president, Mastro Serio, Mr. Mastro Serio, and others, um, and by the way, the new interim uh, director of the Cincinnati Parks Board is an Italian-American, Steve Pacella. 
oh, okay. who's also taken the bull by the horn in wanting to move this issue along. Um, and an interesting development as of recent days, we have a local Italophile, a renowned sculptor by the name of Ted Gans, a superb person who speaks Italian very well, has connections in, in uh, Florence, who has found through his connections the original uh, mold of oh. the statue. Wow. And That's... based on that, things are looking good in terms of if they cannot find it, and I doubt if we can find the, the, the stolen one, that we are able to um, order a remake wow. of the statue from the original mold that was made for Cincinnati. Well, that'd be very, that's, that's fascinating. So that's, it looks like it could be restored relatively quick, I think. Quickly, or, you know, that's yeah. right. And now the, it's in the hands of the individuals that I mentioned who have connections with uh, benefactors of the community to go through, do some fundraising and then go, f uh, then go from there. How much so, money would it cost to, you know, restore the stat? I'm mean, just out of curiosity, how much money would it cost to, would they have to restore only the wolf or do you think they'd have to do the whole thing all over again? I, I would that I'm not technically right. informed to, to know, but uh, whether they can do the, the wolf and attach it with the, uh, the uh, twins that are left on it, or they would have to do the whole, the whole thing. Just at this stage, I, I don't know. But I would say it would have to be in the thousands of, of You're right. dollars. Sure. So, right. uh, and if it's done in Italy, then you have to add the cost of transportation, all of the right. mechanics. And these individuals that I mentioned are are taking the bull by the horn again and uh, and uh, doing their best to to bring this matter to fruition. Well, some of the things you said are quite positive. I mean, I like the idea that the classics department of the university there. Uh, came out in favor of the uh, restoration of the uh, of the restoration of the statue because that's quite different than some of the other experiences we're having with regards to Columbus in cities like Philadelphia and elsewhere yeah. where it's you quite often the university is against you. Right. Uh, we find this happening in Syracuse, New York, for instance, yeah. where the Columbus Monument there it's still standing. The the the, the pushback is the the mayor, of course, and some of the other uh, activists. But also, it's the universities quite often are also on the on the team of. Yeah. Uh, of I, sh I should be clear that I read uh, I read a comment by one of the faculty members, who suggested to the city to the city councilman, you know, to let the issue go forward in restoring the things, and that they would even volunteer to have it stored in their classics department. Something that the Italian Americans would not be in favor. We wanted. Oh yeah, right, of course not. Was. But we do have. I must say. We do have a fantastic classics department that has a lot of connections with Italy. They have uh, sections in, in uh, Pompeii where they're doing uh, excavations and a section in Sardinia, Sardinia where they're doing excavations. They're very well in tune with the Italian uh, archeological uh, treasure that uh, Italy has. So uh, I'm very, optimistic about their they're willing to help in any way shape or form to get this matter resolved the lupa is a wonderful gesture of uh, of history to have here in the midwest in the heart of the united states oh yeah what was the uh, historical what was the, you um the the lupa there when it was um donated uh, just out of curiosity, how big was the Italian American community there in Cincinnati at the time? How, how sizable up was it? You know, it, it's not a very big uh, community. There are pockets of areas of southern Italy, Calabria, Campania, Abruzzo, Sicily, mostly from those from this area. With few, with few from northern uh, areas such as Genoa and uh, uh, the Veneto, the Veneto region. It's not, it, it nowhere compares to uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, right. et cetera. It's a small community. And I must say, at this stage of, of uh, Italian-American activity, it's fully integrated, well assimilated into the community. Sure. So you don't have Little Italy's anymore. They may mention about the old Little Italy's in the downtown areas or in some surrounding areas, but they're essentially non-existent. But there's a great uh, 
affinity for Italian things in Cincinnati. And um, even uh, some industrial uh, areas of Italy have made Cincinnati their home base in the Western Hemisphere. Lusotica, for example, is big in the Western Hemisphere and their home quarters is here in Cincinnati when they bought Landscrafters. Mm. And there are a number of other Italian industries that are there in the area. So the, the actual Italian immigrant community is fully uh, integrated, as I said, and uh, you don't have these pockets like you have in the North End or in, in, in Mulberry Street uh, in New York and so on. Uh, or even Cleveland uh, in Ohio would have the largest Italian American community in, the, in, in this state. But Cincinnati, as I said, it's, it's small, but uh, very well versed in Italian things. And uh, they have annual um, festivals uh, uh, that commemorate different uh, events, and it has the full participation of the community. Everybody loves to eat Italian. <laughs> 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 well, Cincinnati always had, I guess it was mostly predominantly German, I guess. Uh, exactly. For, for the most part, yeah. 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 It, yeah. it, has, it has its origin is, uh, fully in, into a German uh, uh, state, the city. Right. Uh, with, we have a, a large over the Rhine area we call here, which is uh, uh, used to be populated strictly by German. The language was German until World War I. Uh, so that element, uh, and they do have a very vibrant the German American uh, society here in Cincinnati. Well, back then too, in 1931, I, when when the statue was first erected, also people need to also be aware of this, particularly young people. Um, Mussolini and the fascist government at the time uh, did not have the same negative connotation that it does today, obviously. And, and rightly Very so. true. Yes. And Very so true. that's also something to consider. If the people knew what was going to happen, they could look at a, a, a crystal ball and, and realize that Mussolini was going to side with Hitler in World War II, they might have not have accepted this a statue or something out of fact. Exactly. That's also something to consider. They didn't, you know, back at the time, he'd been in power for 10 years, and he had a lot of support among the... Um, the political class here in the United States and elsewhere at the time. Absolutely. In fact, the, the press was uh, very laudatory in the beginning of his actions. Italy had come out of uh, World War I, a lot of turmoil between communists and uh, uh, labor movements and, and other stuff that somehow he came to power and, and started to do things that the public, so to speak, liked. But after that, everything went down the drain. Yes. And yeah. uh, we want to distance ourselves from, from, uh, from that aspect of uh, his uh, reign, if you will. Right, of course, right, of course. Well, it was just, it just uh, uh, at the time, it was, it was, it, World War II had not happened yet. I don't think Hitler even came and controlled Germany at the time yet. I think he was- Correct, when he was later, yes. Had, had, had absolutely changed since then. But right. um, as you were saying in the article, anytime anybody went to see the statue, it was very lovely. It was in a very nice landscaped area of the park. Right. Uh, uh, Mussolini was on anyone's <laughs> mind. It was, it was just a, this is a nice statue. Uh, if you're an Italian American, you'd realize that this was a gift given. And so it was, it was, a, right. it was a positive experience, nothing to do with uh, the former uh, fascist dictator. Yeah, only the Italians would know or some, most of the Italians would know what that symbol X meant, anno, anno uh, 10th, okay? But the rest, nobody would pay any attention to it. It's, and it would not recall, uh, people might ask, who is this governor, you know? But Mussolini would never come up. And, and the fact that the councilman brought it up or stated it, sort of, I felt like a needling aspect of- Oh yeah, sure. So, Let's cut that out. Let's put it into perspective. Yes. No, I do that. Well, you know, you're running that. Well, every city has that, of course. Some politician, somebody will find something that can be potentially galvanizing or divisive, and they'll try to play that for, for whatever purposes it is. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I can't imagine that this had any real serious connection uh, to Mussolini, Mussolini or the fascist government. But I will say this. It doesn't take much to get people, particularly young people, involved, you know, 
thinking, oh, this is a bad thing and I want to maybe damage it, destroy it or whatever right. it is. Right. A lot of statues like that all over the place. And I think this is something also your article suggests. We just have to keep an eye on all this and to be aware of it and be conscious of it to really defend it. That's right. Not, it, it wasn't that uh, the, um, uh, the statue was vandalized with uh, paint and that kind of stuff. It was stolen. But it, it still could give rise to individuals to do things like that. And unless you are heard from the get-go that this is not acceptable, then somebody can hopefully put a stop to this kind of stuff. Because history is written every day, and you can't undo what history has already recorded. And if you have art that accompanies history, all that much the better, because art gives it, gives it deeper meaning uh, to how history evolved. And you suggest also that if they bring the statue back, that perhaps to put some sort of uh, plaque of uh, explanation or something like that to try Correct. and uh, give something more uh, in depth to it. Correct. There is a current plaque, but it's not as informative as the modern times would, would um, necessitate it to be, especially in light of these new things that have come to light uh, fr from uh, politicians and, and other influences. Uh, in the community. So to expand what the significance of the loop is, what the connection with Cincinnati is, I think would help to future generations know and learn uh, what the value of that uh, symbol is. Yes, I, I, I hope so too, because there's just so much that uh, we get from Italy and so many other countries, and it's right there in front of us. And you know, we have a tangible object that we can look at and this will inspire history, not just American history, of course, but you know, go back and inspire um, uh, Roman history, Italian history, and a lot of things. Exactly. And this can be a big, big, big step. Yeah. Only in America, I always like to say, can you have the full spectrum of the world in your, in your hand? Like I mentioned before, you know, there's a beautiful Japanese garden in the same area. You know, now Japan has a wonderful, rich culture. Yes. But sh should it be erased or whatever for, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor? No. You know, or uh, Chinese uh, industry or Chinese uh, cuisine, uh, Chinese art, regardless of the political status of the, of the moment. Sure. We, st we still need to appreciate the overall cultural history of that, of that nation. In Every the, culture has good and bad, too. And if you spend time, you could probably find something negative or bad about what it is that you're looking at here. For instance, a Japanese garden. Who knows? Somebody might say, oh, this was donated by uh, Hirohito or whatever. You can always find something if you, if you, if you search long enough. But, uh, and often these connections are spurious at best. They're not really direct connections. They're very well, indirect. The, the cherry gardens in Washington, D.C. Yes. You know? Yeah. Uh, only in America, we, we really enjoy the benefit of having all the cultures of the world through the immigrants that have come here. No other country, I always tell them, even to my relatives in Italy, no other country can, can say that we have the full spectrum of the world within our, within our border. I mean, well, that's very special. States. Yeah, that's very special. Well, that would be it when they bring back the statue and it's there. And this will be uh, people of Cincinnati. I mean, uh, we'll have a, a wonder. They'll have, be able to see Rome. They'll be able to see the Japanese gardens. They'll be able to see everything. Like you said, a full spectrum right. of, of all cultures. And this is very special. Right. Well, well, this is very good. I, I hope that you can update us uh, as we go along. And uh, if there's anything we can do here at Primo, I'll be happy to uh, you know spread the word, of course, and see what can happen. But uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's it's more what you're telling me. I've, I've been doing this for a while, of course. He, your, uh, the reporting there is a lot more positive. It seems like the um, results are going to be better than what I've seen in some other places with regards no, to I, I'm, a, I'm optimistic, too, yes. that uh, it will be resolved uh, for the betterment of, uh, of everyone. Really. Yes. Well, I hope you keep us posted and uh, as this just moves along. So I hope I will. Involved soon. Yes. I will. All right. Well, well, thank you very much, Gerardo, for being with us today and uh, all the best to you and everyone there in Cincinnati as we uh, move forward with this uh, current situation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Best wishes to you as well. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.